Hi, uh, today is uh, March 14th, 2012, and I'm in the home of Tim and Kathy Driscoll in Saline, Michigan. And I'm Bill Volano. I'm the coordinator for the Veterans History Project uh, that's uh, sponsored by the Ypsilanti Rotary and um, is part of the uh, Library of Congress uh, Veterans History Project. So uh, let, let's start. Now, uh, you and I know each other a couple of different ways, uh, uh, Tim. So, um, you know, we're, you're in the VVA and I'm an auxiliary member of the VVA. Um, and uh, we've been trying to get together and we're together today. What I want to know from you is um, um, you're... You're not a Michiganian or a Michigander or whatever we call that's, it. That's that's correct. Right? Yes, right? you're an Easterner. I was uh, born in, in, a, in a little island just outside of New York, Staten Island. That's not so little. Yes, you know? I know it well. And uh, uh, my uh, grandparents and everybody uh, came over from uh, Ireland, uh -huh. and they settled in New York City, and. Uh, during the Depression, they had, before the Depression, they had about 13 or 14 apartment bu buildings. Oh, yeah. So they came very far in a very short way. They were very hardworking people. Um, my uh, uh, my young education was, was uh, in uh, the Bronx, New York. Uh -huh. And then later on, uh, we moved over to uh, Brooklyn, to PS200 over there. And then later on, we moved over to uh, Newark, New Jersey. And all of these places have a lot of Irish people, you see. Mm -hmm. Like, Irish people like to be around Irish people. I don't know why that works. That's but true with it's, every ethnic group, especially at that time. It's probably the food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, uh, we were all taught, everybody in school back then was, was taught uh, the golden rule and to... You know, to be a hardworking person and, and to emulate your uh, elders and mm -hmm. uh, uh, try and do the right thing with each other and everybody. And I really believe we did a really good job at that because we were told <laughs> and made to do those things. Mm -hmm. And it was a pleasure yeah. because we we actually appreciated each other. Mm -hmm. Their respect was always there. And, and if the respect wasn't there, well, you know, that might lead to a punch in the nose, too. Mm -hmm. So but From your parents. From your, you know, <laughs> you had to behave yourself. There will be punishment, you yeah. know. Don't come home and complain about the teacher. No, 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 no. And, uh, and uh, the schools in the cities were, were very strict. Mm -hmm. Very, very strict. And, and very good. And very good. And you really, truly had to learn your, your lessons. I mean, you there was no you couldn't imagine not doing your homework. Mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine that. You, there'd be so much trouble. Um, in um, Brooklyn, uh, every Friday we had to wear suits and a red tie. And we had to go to uh, the assembly. And we would have class flags and class standings. And uh, we were all, uh, you know, your, your class ranking, as it were, was all processed through your grades. Mm. So if you were the top class or you were the, you know, you were the first or second or something like that, it's a very, very big deal. Social studies was very, very big. Uh, every day we had to read the local papers and uh, find a, uh, a particular story in there, and then we had to write about it. And it couldn't be copying down anything. It had to be your story and how you saw it and what you thought of it. And uh, it was a big deal. Your, yeah. your, your grades would be, uh, you know, accordingly uh, written down. So that was, uh, and it was an awful lot of fun to grow up in, over in New York and, yeah. and uh, in, the, in the cities of, uh, of uh, Newark and what have you over in New Jersey. Um, we moved around a lot. I went to approximately 23 or 24 grammar schools. See, I think you beat me. <laughs> um, I must have gone to at least 10 schools before I got out of high school. See? And, and some of them twice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I used to tease my father as an adult, I did. I used to say, gee, couldn't we pay the bills? <laughs> My dad was a cook, uh -huh. and he had been a cook in the army. Oh, yeah? And so he would go from good job 
to good job to not so good job to need another good job, you know. <laughs> and it and it moved us around uh, an awful lot. Um, uh, somewhere along the line, he he really had started to drink also too much. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that sounds pretty terrible, it was, and it didn't make things any easier on top of everything. But eventually he got very sick because of that. And sure enough, out of God's grace, uh, a priest come to uh, see him in the hospital. His liver was passing away and mm -hmm. what have you. And they got to talk, and they got to talk about AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. And my father took to the priest, and he took to the program, and he got about 35 years of sobriety out of that. Fantastic. And that's why I'm telling the story, because there is a positive. Mm. Also because of that, I got to go to a lot of AA meetings, and they also have a youth group, uh, Al-Anon. Al-Anon, oh yes. Uh, which was also magnificent. So there I am with my peers, and I'm learning life's lessons, and there are doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs, and congressmen, and everything else are going mm -hmm. to this meeting. So... Yeah, it was pretty wonderful life lessons to be learned there, you know, and, and uh, uh, you take it to heart if, 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 you're, if you're blessed with uh, enough of an open mind and what have you. Take it to heart and just try and make it part of your, uh, your life and, and, and know not to do this and not to do that mm, and, yeah. and, and look what everybody did in spite of, you, you know. Later on, things got to be horrible, not with my dad and what have you, but um, early 60s and then on from on, the, uh, young people started to get involved with drugs. Yeah. And to have somebody who, who had a substance problem with drugs and alcohol was just a horrible, horrible double terror. Mm -hmm. You know, and you it was, many of the kids in your neighborhood uh, had problems? No, mm -hmm. no, no. He's very, very blessed with that. We were like... The generation just before, just before it got horrible. Yeah. We were, we were, you know, because when I was in high school, it was, you know, like 1959. We were still children of the 50s. You know, mm -hmm. we weren't that 65 or whatever. And so when we got, uh, you know, old enough to get out of school, which was 61, 62, 63, right in there, uh, within a year or two, you were either in college. Yeah. Which was, which again was run very strict back then, very very strict. College was was not a place. You know, you see the things on TV and what have you about a lot of shenanigans and this that. Uh, not any college I ever went to. I mean, again, by this time I was over in New Jersey. I mean, if you were in Rutgers or Princeton or anything like that, it was so strict. It was amazing, but it was a wonderful kind of of, of restriction because you were there to learn, mm -hmm. and it cost a lot of money. And, and if it took your whole family to send you, or it took you and your family and you had to work three jobs that's what these young people were doing and it was it was wonderful you know it's were society drafted, at its best were you drafted after you got out of high school i was uh, drafted um uh 1965 and um i was uh, working and i had uh, i worked for a uh, electrical supply firm called ocean electric in uh, ocean township new jersey oh yeah yep and uh, no, no, right no, outside no. Asbury Park. And um, I come home from lunch, and there was this big envelope sticking <laughs> out of my mother's. And, you know, we're all watching the dates. Greetings. You know, we're, we're, I, you know you're single. You're not in college. You're of good health. You've already been down to the draft board and signed all your paperwork up. You've already had your physical. You're good to go. You're healthy. Now you're waiting for the date. And there was this big envelope. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, that's it. And it was. So then you have two, three, four weeks, whatever it is, to get ready mm -hmm. and get everything in order. And uh, you do that, and the next thing you know, you're on a bus and you're going to Fort Dix, New Jersey. I was going to say, did you go yep. to Fort Dix? Went to Fort Dix, and uh, uh, we had one of the fellas get off the bus like everybody does and get out there in the line and everything. And as soon as they turned us loose and they went inside that old wooden building, those two-story wooden buildings mm -hmm. with... Uh, no sheetrock in them, mm. and, and, and no insulation, and barely light bulbs and everything. This young fellow went in the front door, and he went out the back door, and we never saw him again, and we don't know who he is. <laughs> he went home. He went somewhere. We never saw him again. <laughs> but we couldn't imagine anybody doing that, you, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, things were uh, a little strict back then, like mm -hmm. I was saying. Um, and... 
you know, I'd already been around a lot. I was in very, very, very good physical health. Um, uh, I used to run on the beach every day. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, I was into everything. I would ride horses and motorcycles and... We would always be out in somebody's boat out in the mm -hmm. ocean or in the, the Shark River, uh, uh, just having a wonderful time. It, it, was, it was just a wonderful time to be a young person and had a lot of friends. And, and uh, um, to be in high school was an amazing thing because there was children of all wealth and all religions and all backgrounds. But we got along just fine, thank you very much. You know, we really did, and, and, and would help each other. And even even back then, though, the, the school I went to, Asbury Park, I went to Long Branch High School for about six months, and then we moved to Asbury Park, New Jersey. And um, the first high school, Long Branch, uh, was really my favorite because I had gone to a school there, also a grammar school nearby, Morris Avenue School, and I'd gone to 6th and 7th grade, or 7th and 8th grade there. <clears throat> And uh, so I had friends yeah. where we all go into the high school together and I was on the soccer team and I was going to be a draftsman and studying for that. And um, it was great. It was a well-rounded, you know, school and I felt very comfortable there and happy there. And we moved. I was very upset. I was very upset. The new school was more like a college. And they didn't have, and, and I was also on the choir oh, mm -hmm. in, in, in Long Branch. I love to sing. I'm Irish. I can't help it. <laughs> you know, if you're lucky enough to either be born Italian or born Irish, you get to sing. You you see, sing. Uh, yeah. That's a wonderful thing. Yeah. You know, we're, we got it right here. Yeah. And um, uh, I'm not the news... sure that I, people would listen to me. I think I'd drive the cows away. <laughs> but you make yourself happy, you see. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> I put the music on and I sing all day. It's all right. You know, I have to worry about it. And... Um, um, Let's see, what was that thought, you know? It's one of, one of those senior moments. Um, the new school didn't have uh, drafting. The new school didn't have a music program. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also part of the, of, uh, uh, the people who would do the audio, audio visual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was part of that. Um, uh, they had no soccer team. Oh I was so lost. And they're all wearing, most of the time, sports jackets and ties, and they belong to sororities or whatever that case may be. Uh, they did, but it was like football, and you had to be huge. Mm. You had to be a very, very big person. I don't think I weighed 115 pounds on any day mm. uh, as a freshman. As a freshman, and that's how I was entering school. And so for me to be in the sports was horrible. My favorite class was science, I, I, you know, because mm. that's that's something I had kind of grown up with. Um, you know, when growing up in New York, you know, you can go to college for free over there. Yes. All you had to do was pass your tests, mm -hmm. you know, back back then. And, uh, you know, we moved from there, so you kind of get a twinge and, and unhappy that you're not there anymore. And uh, then we move over to New Jersey, and I'm in really a wonderful school that fits me beautifully, and i got to move out of there. And now I'm in a school that doesn't really fit me at all. Mm. You know, and I'm really unhappy, and I'm really unhappy. <laughs> and and they really seemed to be just plain mean-spirited because um, maybe it was because I wasn't wealthy. Oh, yeah. Maybe it was because of this, that, and the next thing. I don't know, but it was, the kids were wonderful. The administration was terrible. Is that right? And then there was something else I'd never seen in my life. We had split session. We didn't go to, the, the, the uh, juniors and the seniors went early in the morning like normal school. But the freshmen and the sophomores didn't start school till 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And that was we, my high school. And our homeroom was the auditorium. Oh, yeah? We didn't even have a homeroom. Mm -hmm. And it would be noisy and carrying on. And mm -hmm. so what you couldn't do is you couldn't not do your homework or do half of it or your notes and then come into homeroom and hope to get something yeah. new. How so much was graduating noise. class? Um, uh, about 125. Is that all? Yeah. Hmm. But it was like, again. Be, I don't. I can't why, explain it. You know. Why but two sessions? What that's. Was... There wasn't enough class. It was too many children. Oh. Um, it was just the way things were. You know. Um. Well. The, as big as the building was, it needed to be twice the size, and it was already immense. Esbury Park High School looks even like a uh, a college. Hmm. 
my graduating class was about a thousand. Where'd you go? Oh, it was a, a school in, in New Haven, Connecticut. It was called Hill House. Good school. Um, but we had double sessions. Mm -hmm. For because the same reason, just a lot of children? Just too many kids and not enough space. What year was that? Well, I graduated in 48. Okay. And you see, now that's, to me, that's amazing because I didn't know back then they had split sessions in school. Mm-hmm. My, my, uh, my, uh, my stepdad, uh, after, my, of course, my, my dad had passed away, my mother had remarried seven or eight years later, um, he graduated in 45. Mm -hmm. From Asbury Park High School, uh -huh. you, you know. But back then, there was no split session there. It's just you know where everybody moves and comes back, mm -hmm. and where the jobs are, yeah, and, you right. know how how life pushes us one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, look, when you graduate, you is the war was still going on. Yeah. You know, for another year or two. Well, no, when I was graduated, it was over. The first World War. Forty. Forty-eight. 48, yeah, so World War II was over, right absolutely. On. The next thing we were going to get into was Korea. Korea, yeah. Right. By then I was in college. Good. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm gonna, you know, all of us mean that sincerely because um, war's terrible, mm. you know, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't I, wish anybody in the world to be in a war. I was very, very, very lucky. Um, my wife never liked Texas, but it could have been a lot worse. We were... Spent every day of our military career in Texas. Every day at Brook Army Medical Center. As a doctor? No, no, no. As a social work officer. At that time, they were giving direct commissions to social workers. So Wonderful. I got a direct commission. Our, our basic training, I, I'm interested in your basic training. Ours was four weeks of mostly lectures. I mean, it was pathetic. Um, not what you expected at no, all. No, not what I expected at all. I, I sometimes wonder if I really ought to say I'm, I was in the Army. No, you were in the Army. We were all in the Army someplace doing mm -hmm. something. There's never, there's so many, so many MOSs, yes. you know, and, and jobs and variations and great things. And it's, it's just amazing. Um, As far as being in, in, in Fort Dix down there, the buildings were left over from World War II, uh -huh. yeah. and they were hideous. They were falling apart, and yeah. literally falling apart. And, I have um, some pictures of the World War <laughs> two World barracks, War One, World War One barracks, yeah, barracks, yeah, at Fort Dix. Yeah, right? they didn't change a bit. <laughs> no. I'm saying World War Two. I'm sure they're from World War One. I. I just never grasped that. Yeah. You know, you look at the old pictures, and yeah, that, that looks like my <laughs> building. You know. <laughs> And um, you know, with the butt cans on the on mm -hmm. the on the the posts and and the uh, the iron beds with the mattresses mm -hmm. and those horrible looking mattress things that looked like a mattress but weren't, and you'd have your bathrooms you know downstairs mm -hmm. and the guys upstairs and um, and you know I was really prepared for it I, I really was. Uh, did they train you much at Dix or did they send you somewhere else? Or? No, they they trained us at Dix. And um, what had happened was I I I'd been in the Boy Scouts and and um, uh, to me personally to me it was like a big Boy Scouts with people yelling at you you know mm, yeah. and it was it, then I that was kind of amazing because after maybe a week or two or three they're not yelling really anymore you know you're gonna get up at four o'clock and you're gonna go for your run you're gonna come back you're gonna get ready you're gonna fall out you're gonna go to your breakfast. After that, you come back, you make your beds, you fall out again, and then you go to your day's assignments, you know, uh, which could be anything because we're now going to go to war. See, we're going to go to war, and we're going to go to Vietnam. This is what we were told. We're all going to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We're going to get shot at. And, um, uh, you know, the mantra of the whole situation at that time was kill, kill, kill. Mm -hmm. I hadn't killed anything in my whole life. To this day, I haven't killed anything in my whole life. I haven't Good. shot a deer, a bird. I'm sorry, that's not my idea of, of who I am. I'm not against it. I'll do what I have to do. Why would you do that? You know, it's unless you're going to eat it and you must and whatever, you know, mm -hmm. you don't do those things. Vance's grandkids asked him whether, and he says, I hope not, you know, because he, he used to guard at night. And, of course, he had to shoot something, but 
He hoped he didn't miss. He, he hoped he missed everybody. It, you know, hmm? we didn't even want to be there. Right. They didn't want us there. It was it was a, a double like all wars. You know. On the other hand, uh, your country has a reason for you being sure. there, and and, and and the greater greater picture you never really see or know for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, but because it is your flag, it is your country, it is your fellow uh, countrymen, you, you mm -hmm. will protect each other and you will move forward. And someone blows that whistle, you'll do your job because mm -hmm. that's what you were trained to do. Did they give you any special training afterwards or any of the group special training? We did, but, but what, what happened, I just want to, I want to fit this in real yes, quick. Sure, go ahead. Um, those barracks were so bad, oh, the yes. floors had fallen out of them to the point we couldn't mm -hmm. walk on them. So... What happened with me personally was, before I'd gone right into service there, uh, I was working for a fellow putting in floors. Oh, mm -hmm. And we would get up in the summertime, we would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and go put floors in brand new houses. Mm -hmm. We'd be out there with the hammers. In the summertime, the temperature of the wooden floor would get up to be a couple of hundred degrees. You couldn't stand or kneel on them anymore. So we had to get up very early and build our floors on the new homes. And by 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, we were through for the day because mm. it, would, it would just set you on fire. The heat was so bad. So now I have floors are falling through, and I went and saw my platoon sergeant. I said, Sergeant, we can, we can do this. We can replace these floors. Can you get me some, you know, some uh, sheetrock? Can you, you know, not sheetrock, but, uh, you know, 4 by 8 uh, uh, flooring. And he said, uh, I'll go see. we got to do something. This is ridiculous. Guys are going through the floor. And the plumbing's no good either because the floor has taken the plumbing out yeah, and what yeah. have you. So it's a complete nightmare. Next thing you know, trucks are pulling up <laughs> and, and, and all kinds of nails and this, that, and the next thing. And what they would do is they would keep four of us back and we would build the floors. Uh, we, put, we built the floors for three buildings. Uh -huh. I, uh, I, I never went marching and I, I uh, didn't do guard duty and um, uh, I didn't have to do KP. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to do any of those things because I was building floors with the guys. And uh, believe me, we did have a good time. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> you know, and um, uh, that, I, I mean, I went out and shot my rifle and, and, and you know, and uh, got my sharpshooter's badge and I got to throw one grenade. And that was the first time you learned that when you throw the grenade, you can't throw it far enough. Because when you duck down in that hole after you've thrown it, all that stuff is coming back at you. And I said, my God, the poor guys in Moore, you know, on, on you know, Iwo Jima or wherever it was, where any of these guys who threw that thing, if you had to stand up and you had no cover to get to, you're automatically going to get wounded mm. from the shrapnel from your own yeah. grenade. Yeah, right. So that really wakes you up, you know. Uh, then they had you run through the course where they have the machine guns firing over your head and whatever the case may be. It didn't scare me and it didn't bother me. And three times I had led my group all the way through that to where you're supposed to go down the other end, which is maybe five or six hundred feet. They sent me back three times to do it over and wow. over because I was finishing too fast. Oh, oh. <laughs> They're blowing up these pots of this and that and the dirt's flying. And, and I'm down the other end, go back. I'm down the other end, go back. If you do it one more time, they'll put you in the brig. Just mm -hmm. go back, hang out there, <laughs> get blown up, mm -hmm. and come up with the rest of the guys. <laughs> well, you know, that was the one. I had no fear of it, you know? There was the one part of the training they gave us that was uh, difficult um, because they did it at, at, at daytime and then we had to do it at night. Uh, and it was in Texas, which is full of snakes. And they kept saying to us, Look, we can cure a snake bite. We can't cure a 30 caliber machine gun fire. So stay down. Stay down. Please yeah. stay down. That's what they kept saying. And I wasn't running. I was just good at, you yeah. know, moving moving through the mm -hmm. obstacles. That's all. I thought it was fun. You know, it wasn't supposed to be fun. Well, so. it wasn't supposed to be fun. <laughs> I didn't see it that way. So finally we're out of there and it's Christmas. Uh, we had gone in October. Now it's Christmas and our, the 90 days are up. Mm -hmm. uh, I had thought they had given us wonderful medical instructions because they were deadly serious about us. Your, your buddies are going to be hurt horribly bad and mm -hmm. you're going to have to fix them up until you can get some core people in. So you really did learn how to 
dress the wounds and take care of this, and they were very strict they about it. They teach you how to do tracheotomy. Yeah, tracheology and the whole thing. And suck fluid out of the wounds. Yeah, lungs. you will do everything it takes to take care of your buddy and bring him back. And they said, you know, the thing is, even yourself, if you're wounded and he doesn't know how to take care of you, if you're awake, you better be able to tell him how to do it, or you might not make it back. And then you, you see the stories from Nam and the horrible things they went through in, in anybody in any war. And, and uh, so many brave, brave, brave young men mm. and women uh, just doing the most impossible things to help their, mm. their, their friends get back home somehow, some way. We were prepared for emergent, you know, a, a disaster. And we had all sorts of lectures about how to do the tracheotomy and the lungs and everything else. And finally, one doctor, and, and it was all non-medical people were required to take this. And one doctor finally came and says, quote, keep your damn hands off of them, keep them warm, <laughs> and let, you know, and let it be cut. Because I'm sure that uh, he was sure we were going to kill more people than we were going to say. But, Yet, you know. Uh, remember it, the test you had to take? All the tests, the battery of tests and everything to find out who you were going to be? As it yeah, were, mm -hmm. what? went to sleep in one of them. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah, it was just useless, what? you know. Had the most stupid questions you ever heard in your life. And I said, you know, I really don't care about this. I'm <laughs> going to sleep, but I did. Uh, it wasn't important anyhow, but, you know, they say everything's important, but truly, truly was, yeah. you know. D did they give you any specialized training other than how to put floors in? Uh, when Not not really, not there. I mean, other than the medical, again, and, and, and taking care yeah. of your, your weapon and how to fire yeah. and what have you. And, 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 and yes, I could, you know, we'd already had to march here or had to march there, you know, so I didn't have to learn how to do that. Yeah. But I didn't have to go to any parades. And, and, and when everybody graduated, I wasn't there. Oh, was that right? Yeah, no, no, no. We were back in the barracks finishing oh. up for the next guys. Because, you know, right at, uh, after Christmas, there was going to be a new bunch of guys uh, in that barracks. And, you know, back then we had no ladies. We had no ladies. I mean, oh, mm -hmm. there was ladies in the Army, but they were in the wax. Yeah. We can pause this. Yeah. So, uh, okay. uh, we eventually got, got through with uh, everything that we did down there at Fort Dix. And it hadn't changed since World War II, and it hadn't changed mm -hmm. since World War I. Mm -hmm. It was still very hot in the summertime. I was there from October, December. I was very blessed. If you are going to go to Fort Dix, New Jersey, that was the best oh, time of the year to yeah, be there, you know. Yeah. By the time it was starting to get cold, we left. One day we're out there uh, firing our weapons, and um, and it was pretty cold. It was in the 20s or whatever it was, early in the morning. It was, mm -hmm. still, it was still chilly. And uh, they kept bringing coffee out to us and bringing coffee out for the break. And, you know, coffee's great, but it goes through you, yeah, right. and it doesn't stay with you, and it doesn't energize you. And I talked to the sergeant. I'm always talking to the sergeant. I said, look, why don't you have him send us out soup in the big pots rather than coffee? Any kind of soup. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, it's going to be better than that coffee. You know, from then on, when we were out in the field, they brought soup out for us, and the guys loved it. Oh, great. You know, because we had our, our little tin cans, you know, and everything, and we just pour it in there, and, and it would make you feel good because the soup has got something in it, mm -hmm. you know, it didn't taste bad. Fortunately, then, I had a sergeant that would listen to you. We had, I had a really, a really, a very intelligent fellow who was a sergeant. There was a sergeant, my, my, my platoon sergeant really was um, uh, a, a great sergeant. He was a, a wonderful instructor. You know, he, he really was, he cared very much about what he did and his people. And he was there for one thing, was to get you folks instructions so you could uh, go do your job wherever you were going to go and come back alive. That's what mm -hmm. he was all about. Yeah. Now, we had a fella in the next platoon, next door, who was, um, I believe he was from Korea originally and, and you know, and then mm -hmm. become uh, a citizen uh, of our country. And he was tough. He was mean. He was, he was actually physically abusive to all mm. of his guys. Now, very badly, he was punching them and he was this. and he was, It was bad. It was very, very bad. I had a very good friend who was next door, okay, so I would hear the horror stories. On the other hand, they really learned what they had to learn from him. And uh, my one buddy, uh, he wound up um, uh, in infantry. Mm -hmm. And he wound up with a bronze star. Mm -hmm. 
and he was he was my buddy before we went in the service. We got had gotten drafted at the same time. I mean, we were out there riding the horses and, and, and helping out with the tractors and taking in hay and everything else out there in New Jersey back then. So we were farm kids, and he went from that to somebody who could be in Vietnam and uh, do what he had to do and be the brave person he had to be and come home. And when he came home, he became a banker. Oh, uh-huh. You know, and uh, to this day, that's what he did. And he's now retired, and, you know, he has a, a wonderful life. God bless him. So, you know, everybody has a different experience in, in the service, you know, yeah. whatever service it is. Do you think it's, uh, the, the training by this sergeant helped him to survive? Absolutely, because he wouldn't have survived without it, because um, he, he, needed, uh, he needed discipline, mm. and he needed instructions um, uh, to really be the person he had to be. Again, that, that mantra of kill, 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 this, this sergeant took it very, very, very seriously. Mm. Ours did too, but not to that yeah. extreme. You know, he, um, we had a, uh, a time when we had to learn the bayonets, mm. how to you know, put them on, and, and then we had these pieces of pipe, and it stuck out, and it had some, um, I guess it was cloth wrapped up with duct tape, and we had, and we had to take the rifle and do this with it. And the first thing I did was snap my raf- my rifle in half. <laughs> <laughs> and the sergeant says, Driscoll, what am I going to do with you? <laughs> Go get another weapon and explain to the armor, what, armor <laughs> the armor, what you did to your country's weapon. <laughs> I broke an half, sir. You know? <laughs> so, you know, uh, it was just an old gun. You know, mm. it was just an old gun. And it had gone to the... Uh, to do its duty too many times and finally just fell apart, yeah. you know. But um, uh, we didn't know where we were going to go. We went to training next. You became whoever you were that last day, you know, when you graduated, when you got your piece of paper and it said where you were going to go for training. And I really, really didn't want to be in infantry. I really didn't want to be in infantry. Uh, but when one of the things, somebody had told me a couple of things. If you really want to go somewhere, every time they ask you a question, tell them that's where you want to go. That's where you want to go. For some reason, I just kept writing down Germany. I just did. Germany, 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 Germany. And I never gave it another thought. And then comes my orders through, and um, they wanted me to be a truck driver. Well, I can drive a truck, and that's one of the things you had to write down, which you could do. I could drive a truck, you know. So next thing you know, I'm going to Fort Leonard Wood, uh, Missouri. Oh, yeah, Missouri. Going yeah. to Missouri, and uh, and now they always call that place uh, Fort um, Lost in the Woods. Yeah. Fort Leonard Wood becomes Fort Lost in the Woods. And that gets very cold. Uh, I was there New Year's Day of 1966. And not knowing, not knowing, because I, I'm, I'm a good, uh, I'm a good soldier, and I do everything I'm told, and I'm, and I do it in a timely fashion, and do it the right way, and I'm the only one in the barracks, because everybody else has decided to go late. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, if it's a Sunday or a Monday, whatever that date was, I was there, nobody else. So now I got to go find somebody and, and get the keys to the building, and we were heat that. Um, I, I back in uh, New Jersey, that was kerosene. Those buildings were heated by kerosene. This one's heated by coal. Oh my. By coal, for heaven's sake. Same thing. Uh, the floors were good, but there's no insulation in the walls. I can't imagine why. The same World War One, World War Two buildings, and they're heated by coal. Now the good thing is, I was raised in wood stoves, and I was raised with coal stoves. And I know how to bank a fire, and I know how to clean them out, I know how to keep them nice, and I can get the most out of that, that boiler, okay? And um, I became the fireman. Oh, yeah? It got to be, that winter, it got to be, at one stretch for six or seven days, it was 35 degrees below zero, day and night. Oh, we couldn't shut off trucks, or cars, or generators, or anything, they would freeze solid. And I had never been that cold in my life, and I don't think any of the other guys had either. Mm. It was terrible. Um, and the, the, the warmest I could keep the buildings was 55 degrees, and we thought that was wonderful. Um, if 
guys, when after you're, after you're there in training for two or three weeks, they, they give you start to give you passes to go if you're doing your job. And um, they would go home, you know, Chicago maybe. They would go to Chicago because that was three, four hours away, that type of thing, or somebody, you know, in Illinois or something close. And uh, the guys would go home and, and get a lot, two or three guys in a car and off they'd go. But the ones that had to stay back, like me from New York and New Jersey, we had to stay there. Um, um, we were still too young to know that you could go get a motel room <laughs> or a hotel room somewhere and spend your money because I had no bills anyhow. I'm in the service, you know, outside of sending money home to, to my mom, and um, uh, which is what I should have done. Okay, but not knowing there, we stayed in the building, and we'd actually sleep between two mattresses. Oh. That's how we slept for the weekend until the guys came back, and then we'd put the mattresses back and what have you. Uh, and spend as much time out of the building as you could. So you went bowling if you could, and we stayed in the chow hall as long as we could. I'd even do dishes, pots and pans, if I could just stay there. Was it warmer there? Absolutely, because they were cooking food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, right. yeah. And the cook was happy to have, uh, uh, help? have, have the help and have us there. And they were, they were training. Their building was right next door to us. And we had the most wonderful food. This guy, this, this chef we called him, you know, uh, he was a great cook. He cooked us wonderful meals. He, 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 shoe leather, he would turn it into a wonderful steak mm -hmm. for you. You know, he was just a good cook. A lot of nice cakes and pies and whatever. And, and uh, you know, uh, everybody just loved them. And um, uh, we went to, first we went to Jeep training. And our Jeeps had been modified quite a bit from World War II. They now had independent suspension in the back of them. Oh, yeah? And if you went over, we'll say, a bump here and a bump there, uh, what would happen, of course, this one would pick up first, and then this side would pick up, and, mm. and it would stop, you know, where normally it would just react like this. Mm. Well, one would stay up and one would stay down. What they were really, these units, these were really for radios. For radios? The Jeeps were for radios over in Vietnam. Because they wanted, you know, everything is communication, safety yeah. and communication, and, you know, uh, where you're going to have an operation. they got to have, everybody's on the radio somehow, forward observers, and, you know, anybody who could hear something could do something, you know, could do something about a very bad situation at any time. So whether it was handheld or in the back of the Jeeps or inside the tanks or up in the planes, whatever, it was all about communications, and that's what these were. So we had to learn how to run the radios. Okay, you thought you were just going to be a Jeep driver. No, 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 you're going to be a radio man, you're going to be a Jeep driver. And then they moved us into the trucks. And when they moved us into the trucks, and we all thought, again, we all thought it was fun. Okay, so we were happy to do this. It was, it was no, no big thing. And um, we didn't have to fire any weapons or anything. And we were then uh, assigned to the engineers of the post, because that's an engineering post. And we used to go up into the mountains. Uh, they're very large hills. They're not really mountains. Mm. You know, they're very large hills. And uh, they were blowing up rocks up there, uh, you know, using DDT and uh, um, TNT, right? TNT, yeah. And uh, they bore the holes in the rocks and fill them full of, uh, you know, whatever they were going to fill them with and blow them up. And then all the rocks would come down, they'd crush them, and then he would throw them into our big dump trucks, and we'd go down the road, and they were building roads with them. Everybody's got good training, everybody's fine. Um, um, it's, it's what we did, and it's how we passed the time. You know, and in the weekends, we just tried to stay warm. Uh, um, they tried to keep you out of the nearby towns. Uh, the nearby towns were really very, very, very rough. They really didn't like GIs. Oh, I was going to say why. Um, because GIs just wanted to go there, get drunk, and get in trouble. Mm. And so they didn't want you there. So they said, don't go there, don't go there. So we didn't go there, you know. Uh, I had a buddy, uh, uh, Mitch Bernardchuk, uh, was from uh, New Jersey's... Uh, Capital Trenton. He wanted to go see a movie, real bad. Mitch, it's 35 below out there. You, you shouldn't. Nobody should go out there. Oh, I can wear my class A uniform, my fancy hat. Well, that's good. You'd be really better off with your fatigues and your bunny hat, you know, over your ears, and uh, your big mittens, you know, they had given you to do our jobs every day and stuff, you know. By the way, you love to be in the trucks because the trucks had heaters. Mm -hmm. which you never turned off, you say. You didn't have to load the trucks. You had to just drive the trucks, you say. You're a taxi driver, you know. That was a good thing. And um, so we, we did the best we could, and uh, and, and the guys and the uh, engineers were uh, really great to work with them. Uh, 
they were building bridges, they were building roads, they were, uh, we learned how to take the wheels off the truck and replace them with, uh, these These are six wheel drive vehicles, yeah. we learned how to uh, uh, brace them up with uh, actually pieces of logs where we could get that thing to, in mm -hmm. spite of the wheels or the tires might be missing, we could, we could actually uh, make like a, a big brace out of it and just mm -hmm. replace the tires and the wheels and still get where you had to go. For a while, you know, for a while until that one more. Now you have to build another yeah, one. Yeah, sure. So uh, a lot to it, an awful lot to it. Uh, we had the Air Force come down a few times explaining to us that, you know, um, if you're going to have this truckload of men, this truckload of ammunition, this truckload of food, it really, really, really has got to get where it's going, you know. And that's, again, back to communications. you got to be able to tell them that, you know. Uh, we're proceeding where we have to go. You got to know what to use and the codes and everything else. And uh, you want to know where you're going ahead of time. We had to learn how to read a map properly. You know, using a watch and using a, a compass. And, and there was a lot to it. You know, this, sure. this wasn't just again like a taxi driver. There was there was a lot to it. And uh, and they wanted us to get them home alive. You know, and that was the other thing. And, and just do the best you could. Um, having said all that, and then finally you graduate and. Um, we're gonna go. We're gonna go to Vietnam. I have my papers right here in my hand, and we're going to Vietnam. I'm going to um, uh, South Korea, and from South Korea, they're gonna send me to Benoit, Vietnam, and that's where I will be assigned from there. And so I call home and tell everybody I'm going to Vietnam. I got my papers and truck driver, you know, 64 B20 MOS, job description. And um, I'm going with my guys tomorrow morning. We're going to get on an airplane uh, at, uh, at, the, at the post there for Leonardwood. And uh, I'll talk to you when I can, and you know, whether it's in Korea or Vietnam, whatever. And the next morning we get up real early. It's pitch black out, cold as could be. And we've already had a, a deuce and a half with all, the, all of our gear in mm -hmm. and everything, all your bags. And a, guy, a runner comes over from... Uh, the colonel and says that he wants uh, me and Smitty and an, another guy to uh, report to him right this minute. And we couldn't imagine what we did wrong. I have no mm -hmm. idea what we did wrong. And uh, go over there and he says, uh, I don't know what's going on around here. He says, but you guys are not going to Vietnam. So yes, sir. I uh, <laughs> we are. My bags are packed and I'm ready to go, just like the song, you know. <laughs> and, and we're out of here, sir. We're ready to go. We did exactly like you said. Everybody's been counted twelve times. They're ready to go. No, you're not going anywhere. There's there's a hold on your paperwork. You're going nowhere. You go back there. You get every one of your bags and you three guys get in that building, lock the door, keep it warm, and let nobody in, and say goodbye to your buddies. And we did that. Hmm. A hundred days later. So what they did, they assigned us to uh, battalion headquarters as chauffeurs oh. to take administration people out to the airport. That's all we did. All day, we, we, we read magazines and newspapers and had coffee and went down to the bakery and, <laughs> and had, and, and had uh, uh, lunch over in the officer's quarters with everybody and everything else, because we had to be by the moment. We had to be ready in a moment mm -hmm. to take them back and forth with trucks and cars and jeeps and everything else. And that's how we spent that 100 days, and all of a sudden we get new orders. And the orders are to go to Germany. Huh. Remember I said I kept writing Germany? Yeah. Now, my other two buddies didn't do that. They weren't writing Germany and <laughs> Germany and Germany, Okay. Um, Where did they go? Well, they went to Germany with me. Oh, the three of us uh -huh. all went together. And uh, they put us on a small plane, took us to New York City, put us on a Navy ship, and took us to Bremerhaven, Germany, and sent us to Frankfurt, Germany. Uh -huh. And then from there, they sent us to Freiburg, Germany, which is a, a beautiful countryside. <laughs> it really is gorgeous mm -hmm. out in the country in Germany. Um, you know, um, you just can never figure out where you're going, what you're doing. Just when you think you have it all figured out, it changes. Yeah. It just changes. Did you ever find out how they selected you? Um, that's an interesting question. One of the times when I was coming home, we were all coming home from the quarry with a loaded truck. Uh, you know, all day you would have, you know, um, 
rocks and everything mm. in the truck and dump them out and back and forth. But at night, we had personnel coming back. We had uh, we had the engineers coming back out of the out of the hills, and we're going down this rather large hill, and it's snowing and it's nasty, and there's no heat in the back. So as fast mm. as you could get the guys in, the better. You know, we really wanted to get them home safe and everything. And doesn't the guy in front of me his truck motor suddenly start to stop running? And um, he's having trouble keeping it in place. He wants to go, so I passed him. I could see he was having trouble with it. And I passed him, and I matched his speed with my speed, and I locked my truck all up and put it in gear. Got the guy who was sitting alongside me to run back there, find out what it is. And he said, no, I just quit running, da, da, da. And I said, Sergeant, just come here. Tell him to switch to his other fuel tank. He's out of gas. <laughs> he went back there, switched the other one, hit the button, and it fired right up, and the two trucks went down the hill. Well, when we all got back the next day, they made a big deal out of it that, you know, I had taken care of a whole truck load of guys, whatever the case may be. And uh, they wind up making me Soldier of the Month. Oh, yeah? Oh, okay. Great. I'm just me. I'm just one of the guys. I'm not Soldier of the Month. Soldier of the Month. Now, that turned into me being able to go to the Red Cross 100th year ball. Now I'm going to a ball, Ooh. right? So now i got to dig out my Class A uniform that I've never worn, not one time, you know, and the pants don't fit. <laughs> 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 and all of those things. i got to go find, find somebody in the barracks who has something my size that really will fit, you know. And I got to get a haircut, and we got to go out in a blizzard to get the, because you got to be as sharp as can be, because, you know, oh, yeah. there's, uh, we're going with, with colonels and, 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 you know, everybody is on a bus, a big, beautiful bus. And we're going to St. Louis. Oh. We're going to St. Louis, Missouri to this ball. And it was amazing. There was some big, beautiful hall, and the ladies were all dressed, they were all nurses. From all the nearby hospitals, mm -hmm. you know, to go dance with with us guys and and have a wonderful time, and the food was marvelous and the music was great and and um, it was just wonderful. It was the most wonderful thing you ever saw. Cause it was a real ball, mm -hmm. or a real orchestra, you know. And uh, did they allow you enlisted men to dance with the nurses? Oh yeah, that's what it was all about. Because we were we were part of the party, you know. Mm -hmm. We we that's why we were there. It wasn't about it wasn't about our rank at all. It was about that we were GIs of all shapes and sizes mm -hmm. and colors, and that we were to come there and, and uh, respectfully thank, uh, you know, the Red Cross for everything they have done for our country through all the wars, you know. Were the nurses Red Cross nurses? They were, or, no, or they were, they, they, were, they, were um, they were all um, um, uh, nurses in training. But they weren't Army nurses? No, they were not Army nurses, oh, no. okay. The oh. only... Uh, there may have been one or two, but I didn't know it, and no one ever pointed that out. And they wouldn't be dancing with you. And that. they wouldn't be dancing with you because what they would have been was wax. Well, they were women's army corps. No, there there was a nursing corps. No, no, there was a nursing yeah. corps. But I'm saying when I, I'm, when I rephrase that, on our post, it wasn't a nursing school per se that we ever saw. All we saw was a, a detachment right near us of wax. And what was unusual about that, it had the highest poles you ever saw in your life, and it was all barbed wire, mm -hmm. and it was all lit up at night with big searchlights and everything else, and you were told to never go near that. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't even know it was there after that, because mm -hmm. they told you don't do something. It, mm -hmm. it was it was there very strict. Again, it's, like, it's the, the way things used to be, you know? Well, in... 55 and 57, I had a, I guess in 57, I had a tech who was going out with a nurse and they had to sneak around because if they ever found out, she'd be court-martialed and he would too. Having spoken to many, many of our mutual nurse friends, that is exactly the truth. They both that be in trouble. so stupid. You could get drummed right out. Yeah. Yeah. After all that training and everything yeah. and, you know. You could you could lose everything. It'd be and it'd be a horrible thing to lose, you know. I, sure. Because we're you know it's part of our our training. It's who we are by then, you know. You're you're very very uh, passionate mm. about how far and what you've done. It's like anything else, you know. If you're lucky, you you understand it that way. Mm. And um, 
here I am, and uh, we're going to be truck drivers. Are telling us, and they put us on a beautiful, beautiful. Well, when we got out of, we got over there with the the um, the boat in Brahma Hobbit. Uh -huh. um, they put us on a train that looked like the Orient Express. Oh, mm -hmm. it was the most, and it's and it's a real steam engine. It's it's not a locomotive. It's not a, an electric mm -hmm. one or something like back in New Jersey, or it's not a diesel. Mm -hmm. It's just they're firing coal in this thing. You know, it was fantastic, and it had those wonderful little petitions. You know, they were mm -hmm. all separate and everything. And we had one of those. They brought you the most wonderful meals. Mm -hmm. And then people would come around and try and sell you some cigarettes because back then everybody smoked, of course. Absolutely. You know. And they had candy and this and that, and, and uh, uh, the trains all had like doilies all on the mm -hmm. back of them, mm -hmm. you know, for your head. And it was amazing. Mm -hmm. It was just an amazing trip down to where we had to go. And uh, we got to Frankfurt, and we spent a few days there, and they said, you guys are going to be in this outfit. And they put us in a couple of Jeeps and sent us about 30 miles away to where we were stationed. And right off the bat... They put us right into changing tires and doing this, because you have to learn all this, because this is what goes on every day there. And they would take us out on trips to go pick up this supply and that supply, and we're driving five-ton trucks and half-ton trucks and a deuce and a half and all kinds of different things. And that's our job. We're in the support platoon of the 3rd Armor Division Headquarters Company Tank Outfit. 3rd Armor. 3rd Armor Division, 7th mm -hmm. Armor, 7th Armor uh, Europe, Third Armor Division of the Seventh Armor, Headquarters Company, uh, Third Armor Division. So we have approximately 12 tanks. And there's a Headquarters Company, and then there's an A Company, a B Company, and a C Company. So, you know, we've got f almost 50 tanks. Mm. So that's a lot of, when, when we get an alert, which would be once or twice a month, and we all have to roll out at whatever time, whenever that horn goes off, we're out the door, running down to whatever vehicle we're, we're assigned to. Uh, that vehicle is already... Uh, there's no ammunition in these tanks. The ammunition always stays... Um, I mean, unless there was a war alert, but that, that never happened. That never happened. It was always in the ammo dump way mm -hmm. down the other end of the... And uh, same thing with the fuel dump. That was also way mm -hmm. down. God forbid somebody blew it up or caught yeah. fire. It wasn't going to take the fort with it. The barracks we were in... <laughs> were the most beautiful barracks you ever saw in your life. Um, they were from World War II, maybe even a little bit newer. The floors were marble. Mm -hmm. They had big, wonderful windows that would fold out, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we just crank it. Huge things, you know, from the floor up. And uh, the bathrooms, it was, it was it had heat, <laughs> had really heat, <laughs> oil heat, you know, with thermostats. And, okay. and they were, after what we'd just gone through, you know, for the past three, four or five months, it was, it was just heaven. And, um, and you had your real job, as it were, you know. And so whatever it was, whether you were assigned to the, you know, the petroleum dump, if you were assigned to an officer, if you were assigned to... Uh, a particular route, whether it was going out to the garbage dump and bringing everything out there, or picking up food, or a combination thereof, um, you know, it was all these things you had to learn. And again, there was the use of the radio, uh, learning the maps again, working again with the Air Force, because you had to learn a lot of things all over again because mm -hmm. it was very serious. What we're doing is trying to protect the full the gap, so if there was a war or the Russians decided to come across, uh, any distance at all to really, you know, to start something or to be, um, uh, you know, just to be uh, a little um, pain in the tush, I guess, mm. would be the right word, you know, uh, to the Americans and yeah. the Germans and everybody, because they were always threatening to do a little something, mm. saying, never mind to start a whole nuclear war. The trouble was, if they did it, it was going to turn into a nuclear war. It wasn't going to turn into a tank battle, and it wasn't going to worry about any of this other stuff. Somebody was going to push a button, somebody else was going to push a button, and then it was not going to be any somebody's. Yeah. And we didn't think about that, because we weren't going to think about that, because that was unthinkable. Mm. We already had people taking care of that business, but it was terrible. It was terrible on, on the people who, who lived in that country and lived in Russia and lived in the rest of the world. Mm. Nobody wanted a nuclear war. Nobody. There's no winners in, in that, that horrible, horrible thought. Um... But um, we got to move around in your unit. Eventually, everything kind of shakes out. Who's a better this or who's mm -hmm. a better that and what have you. And pretty soon, 
um, they would try it with the ammo where we would go out. Uh, if there was a, um, we'd go for training about three, th every other three months uh, out to a place uh, either called uh, Vile Thicken uh, or um, um, Grafenveer, which is still a post, an army post to this day. Matter of fact, some of our, uh, one of our Vietnam guys, uh, his uh, daughter's husband is in the service and they're stationed over oh, there yeah. in Grafenveer in Germany. And what that is, is, is Rommel from World War II, the Desert Fox, his training area. That's where he trained all of his people uh, in tank outfits to go all over the world and take over the world. Mm -hmm. was, was that. So we're using his training area. And it was the most amazing thing you ever saw because they had huge underground bunkers to store the ammunition and to store people in hospitals and all kinds of things, all underground and all this. It, it's, it, I, f I forget how big is it, how many square miles this thing is, but mm. it's, maybe it's 50 miles square or something mm. just for the tanks to be trained in, in, in warfare, you know. Uh, and it's most, it's all dirt and sand, and, you know, if it wasn't, pretty soon it will be because that's yeah. what the tanks will turn it into is, is that. And um, uh, there's hospitals out there, and there's... You know, uh, it's it's a huge, huge post. But where you're staying, because <laughs> you're in training, you're going to be uh, staying in tents or little one-story buildings, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and um, they still have oil heat, thank God, though. They are warm. The buildings are warm. But if you're out there in your tent or you're out there and it's raining in the wintertime, which happens and we get snowed yeah. on and this, that, and the next thing. So we got a lot of training. And all the training was, for one thing, was to stop them at the at the uh, Fulda Gap in case it didn't go nuclear. Mm. We had to try and stop them there. And, of course, you know, the Air Force would come, our Air Force would come, and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. That must have been... And it didn't happen. Yeah. Must have been pretty uh, tense, though. No? You, you had to think about it because that's part of your training. Mm. You, have to, you have to be sharp. So you had to be sharp about your training. Uh, and and like everything else they taught you, you have to watch out for your buddies. Yeah. That they're not going to get hurt, or they're not going to hurt you because they're not thinking about something. Yeah. Probably the hardest part of of anybody being in any war or or being away like that is home. Mm hmm Yeah. Because there's things happening at home that you can't fix. Right. And one of the first things they try and teach you when you go in the army specifically is, and you're a young man, don't get married. While you're in the service, unless you're going to make a career out of it, and in five, six, seven, eight, nine years down the road, you found somebody you just like to be with, and you know, and, and they will understand that you know, army life or something's going to be rough because they're going to be alone a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to be with you. You're going to be stationed in probably mm -hmm. different countries and what have you. And it is. It's very, very, very hard. And you know. The ones who got a letter from home all the time, Louis' mom did or whatever, that was mm. terrific. Mm. That was terrific. But then you'd have people who didn't get any letters from mm. home. And, um, or there would be a problem at home and they couldn't fix it, you know. Or somebody was not treating somebody properly and the next thing you know they're getting divorced or something like that. Yeah. And it was just heartbreaking because what affects them affects you. And sure. if they're upset, you're upset. And gee, that could happen to me. And they would mm -hmm. then have to get maybe on a plane and go home, or mom or dad or somebody would pass away or be in a horrible accident. And now they got to get on Nothing a plane. You about if it, you yeah. can, you know, you go down to see the Red Cross. You do all you can, because you're always able. If the, if the sergeant would ever say, mm -hmm. "I'm sorry, I can't spare you," da, 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 all you have to really do is go down to see the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. They will they will make it happen. They will get a hold of generals and colonels and majors and make that happen you yeah. know the plane will be back then we could run military air transport yeah right and, and they would just here's your orders you're gone you didn't have to worry about paying for a plane mm. or anything like that uh, we're, I, I, nowadays I, it's not like that yeah. i'm know? assuming you weren't married at the time no 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 how no. long were you in germany Did you... Uh, i was there for um let me see i was there uh Seventeen months. Oh, mm -hmm. Seventeen months. Long time. It is to me. It's a long time. You know. Mm -hmm. um, what and, was your uh, What was your draft at that time? Was it two years or three? Two years. years three two years. years. Mm -hmm. 
when we went down to get our physicals, they had given us an option at that time, if you passed, yeah. mm -hmm. if you passed your physical, that you could join the Marines um, for four years, you could join the Navy for three, three years, years yeah. or just get drafted for two, and they had something else where you could join the Army for three or four years and they would start you out as a private or something. Mm. They had a little something they could do for you. And considering we didn't know what we were doing or where we were going, I didn't want to go to Vietnam for four years yeah, or right. three years. We had no idea. As much as they tried to train you, they were always trying to be very straight with you. Mm. Where you're going is going to be war. And you've got to be prepared for that somehow, some way. And you're going to have to adapt. And you're going to have to adapt. And you're going to have to adapt. And so because of the training, um, you will adapt. Yeah. I think that's a, a very, very great part of your training, that you, you, you must uh, be that army of one, even though they weren't using that logo mm. back then. You've got to be able to think for yourself, and you've got to be able to follow mm. orders, and you've got to be able to take over uh, your personal situation in a bad situation. And I mean, you may have to mm. take care of you and your buddies, mm. and vice versa. Where, where did they where did they discharge you from what New the, York City from New York City yeah they took us to New York City uh, and uh, uh, they discharged us we arrived there and then they sent us down to uh, Fort Dix oh, I mustered out of Fort Dix but they brought us into New York to to spend a few days and uh, we spent a few days there went to Fort Dix and finally we mustered out of there <laughs> what did they do then well then you have to just really leave the place so I, I'm only, I'm only, I was living in Asbury Park at the time. I'm only 20 miles, 30, 30 miles the most away from my home. Oh no, we, the, the bus doesn't go there. So I have to go to Newark, New Jersey. And it's pouring rain. And, and, but I'm thrilled to be home. I don't care. When I really got off the plane, it was funny. The plane that went from Germany to come home um, uh, was something like Hawaiian Airlines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and the, the hula girls were on it. What, who knows where this plane came from? It was, it was hysterical. And we go, and of course, everybody kissed the ground. We had to be home. Mm -hmm. You know, most of, us have, most of us haven't been home in a long time. Yeah. And um, uh, like most guys during uh, this whole thing, I'd gotten a Dear John letter. Oh, yeah. In my case, it was a Dear Tim letter. But that was okay. She was in a family oh, yeah. way, and I had nothing to do with it, you know. <laughs> Were you going out with somebody at the time? Yeah, I wasn't. You know, mm -hmm. it was somebody I had I had uh, been engaged to a, a few years back, and it didn't work out, and it was mm -hmm. okay. And then she started writing me, and and it wasn't planned to get married or anything, but maybe it would have went that way. Yeah. You know, uh, she had gotten a little older. I got a little older, but in the meantime, she... I uh, was still going out, out with people. When I got out, I was uh, 21. 21, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, actually, let me see. I went in I went in, in 60, 65, and I was 20. So I was 22. Oh, mm -hmm. I was 20. My birthday's in July, so that, that kind of, you know, puts you between some stuff there. But, because um, so I, I, I really couldn't go get a drink. Hmm. You know, because it was 21 back then. I mean, yeah, I, I couldn't right. go off post. They wouldn't let you off post anyhow in Fort Dix. Wasn't it in New York? Wasn't it 18? 18, yeah. yes. So, of course, we used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we used to go over to New York and, and have a few beers and, mm -hmm. and, and come back, and that was fine. Uh, but um, the um, just, just the thought of uh, being home was wonderful. My mm -hmm. uncle picked me up at uh, the station in Newark, and he lived in Bloomfield, and we went over his house. And I stayed with him. Um, I went and see my mom and what have you uh, down the shore, down Asbury Park. But I stayed with him for about three, four months. And he was a frogman in World War oh, II yeah? in, mm -hmm. in, uh, the, uh, in the Pacific, and he had uh, five different ships blown out from under him. Being a frogman back then was a set of flippers for your feet, some grease to put on your body, mm -hmm. snorkel mask, and of course they had tanks when they were available. Usually being on a submarine to get where you're going, and then rubber boats. 
and they would, you know, send mm -hmm. you in and with all your... And he was um, a demolition man. Oh, boy. He was a demolition expert. So he would go in and try and clear the, the beaches. And and, um, and I can't tell you which beaches. I can't tell you it was this winter, you know, Pepe Lou or anything. I don't remember... Mm. You know, he was one of those guys, like we were saying before, we didn't talk too much about mm. it. But if he talked to somebody, it was me. Why? Because he just loved me, and he would tell me a little about and I'm in the service. The, him and my other three uncles were all mad at me anyhow. They were all Navy men. <laughs> and I went in the Army. <laughs> After listening to all those stories all my life about how hard it was on ship, you think I was going to go join the Navy? <laughs> no, I wasn't going to go join the Navy. They were in typhoons, and you know, the ships would break down, and they were in war. My one, one uncles, uh, they were, uh, my two of my uncles were um, uh, gunners in um, uh, destroyer escorts. And both of them had actually been in action. Their, their mm. ships had been in action. And one of them had sunk a submarine. Mm. He was on the SS Thomas, and it actually uh, had caught a, 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 uh, a German sub on the surface because they had to recharge their batteries, and they didn't see it coming. I guess they kept looking that way, didn't know that Thomas was, was right alongside of them almost. They offered, the captain the Thomas offered to take all of the personnel off the ship because he was going to sink it. And the captain and what have you said, that was wonderful, one to bar, one to bar, and they took off most of the troops at the last minute. One of the guys went and ran for the deck gun on the sub. Mm -hmm. And the Thomas opened fire, and the sub went up kind of like out in front of it, and they ran it over. And I've got, I've got newspaper clippings of this, mm. of, the, of the sub being run over and everything, that I found on the computer. Huh? Now, you know my, my uh, Uncle Marty, who's still alive, God bless him, in Philadelphia, never told anybody about that. Hmm. This is Uncle Marty. Your ship was the Thomas. Yeah. And um, it was Troyer Escort. Yeah. I says, and you were gunner. Yeah. And you ran over a submarine and sunk it. <laughs> oh, I didn't tell you that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> left that little... You left that little thing. You suck a submarine, you know? And um, uh, I lost an uncle in World War II. He was a cook. And the stove blew up on his ship. Oh, my. And that's how he died. It just blew up. There was a gas leak, apparently, and gone. Mm. I mean, you know, as we both know, when you're in the service, accidents happen, oh just like out here on the street, yeah. you know. Um, I had, um, oh, what I didn't say before, my job in, in, in Germany there had gone through these many different phases, and pretty soon I'm the guy who takes a jeep out to our prison for uh, anybody who's broken any you know military mm -hmm. laws or what have you and um, I wound up being not just the jeep driver I then became the um, the guard oh, yeah. and the thing about being a guard you you actually had to like promise that you would shoot these people if they got loose and so the first thing you would tell them is if you try and break loose I'm going to shoot you I never shot anybody. <laughs> right. I also became part of uh, uh, every other Saturday. Uh, I would go out with a sergeant on Saturday night and bring our guys, our guys back from town. So there was no fist fights, and nobody wanted up in jail downtown mm -hmm. or anything like that. We'd bring them back alive, guys. So I got to be part of that. Uh, I went with the colonel into Frankfurt, and we would go get all of our payroll. And uh, so I became part of that. I'd go to Frankfurt and get all of our mail. So there's five or six guys that rotate to do all these things, you know. I uh, didn't pull too much guard duty, again, because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing other things. Um, we had, uh, you know, you talking before about uh, uh, Vance, my, my buddy over mm -hmm. in Vietnam who was a dog handler, uh, was one of them. And we we're talking about dogs. And I said, you know, we had a dog... Uh, say we had a, a, a mechanized artillery unit. We had we had mortars on on our post. We had uh, uh, infantry. We had some infantry. We had the mechanized cannons, you know, on ours. And uh, we were out in the field, and one of them caught fire in the middle of the night. And they had a German shepherd. Mm. They had a German shepherd that one of the guys had, and they let him keep it. And the dog just went crazy and woke them all up. And the four or five guys escaped and they're fine 
Don't you know the fire gets worse? The dog goes back in thinking there's somebody else in oh there. My. There's a small explosion. The dog dies inside the vehicle. And and the whole post, they, the, the, the colonel of the post actually threw a military um, uh, assembly and honors oh. for that dog. And I, have, I don't have pictures of the dog, but I do have pictures of the mechanized uh, piece of artillery oh, all burned. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things you, you, you go through as far as accidents happen and things yeah. happen to you. Um, but I wind up uh, actually being in charge of uh, a, a com what they call a command track, a 577. Now, this, this unit has, it looks like a, a, a personnel carrier, except it's a big box. It's a big square box, and um, um, I should have brought my hat out because I have a picture of it. I have I have uh, little ones on my hat, yeah. and um, it's all radios in there. There's three radios in there. There's a generator on top, mm. and for the last year, that's all I did was take care of this. And every morning, I had to open up the net for all our 12 tanks and everything, and I'd open it up. And so we could all have communications, and everything had to come from me, so I had, I had a secret clearance because we had to have, you know, that to, to get the messages out. And we went out in any kind of a, a, a movement or anything or out in training, uh, everything had to go through our track, you know, had to go through mm -hmm. our office, as it were. And we had teleprompters in there and stuff. Anything that we brought in or had to come in and out, it had to go in and out of that track. The track had to be perfect, had to be in the, the best shape of all. Matter of fact, we had a huge um, um, battalion um, uh, inspection, you know, of the vehicles. Mm -hmm. Mine was the top one. It could have knocked me over with a feather. I mean, I really had worked very hard on this thing. And it's funny, because they gig you for everything that could be possibly yeah. wrong with your car or truck or boat or plane or whatever you got, tank. And uh, I really thought I had this thing perfect. I thought it was a thousand percent ready to go and it was perfect. And the guy says, nope. He says, you got one thing wrong. I says, I can't imagine what it is. He says, you put the, um, um, the, uh, the air cleaner uh, holder, that shroud that holds your air filter, it's on backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I put it on and, and didn't, it didn't have a snorkel on it, it was just round. But on, on the front it says face forward, mm -hmm. like a Claymore mine, it says face forward. It, it was turned around. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wound up with the best vehicle on the post. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it just winds up, after a while, if, you, if somebody can count on you, and they can count on you in your unit, in your, in your barracks, in your platoon, whatever, things are just nicer. Mm. They are. They're just nicer, and they treat everybody a little bit better, and you feel good about it because you know you're doing a good job. Colonel offered me, when it was time for me to muster out, um, $10,000 for re-up re money, uh, and he would send me to any Nike base in the United States that I wanted to go to. Wow. And I didn't take it. Are you I kinda sorry? wish that yeah. I think it had to do with rockets. You know, when we grew up with guys going to the moon and yeah. rockets this. I'm trying to put that together in my head. But I think it had something to do with that and and I was blown away because now before I got in draft, I just before I got drafted, I was working for an electrical supply company. I had really great test scores and stuff, but I wanted a truck driver, you know, because that's what they needed that, that day or that half hour. Uh, and, and he said, you know, you got the training. He, he says, you'd be perfect fit for that. He said, I'd, I'd love to see you go into that. And I says, there's only one problem. He says, what's that? I says, you're not going to be there. He was retiring. Uh -huh. You're retired. I said, sir, I will go anywhere you go right now. I will sign that piece of paper. You go somewhere, and I will go there, and, and, and I'll do anything you would like me to do. I'd be proud to follow you. I'm going home, Tim. I says, me too, sir. <laughs> <laughs> he says, well, you think about it, and, and you know, when, when you get home, you got, I, I forget how much time it is. You can still get back in the service. Yeah. He says, and I will give you a letter to that effect. That It's my recommendation that this is what happens with you. I didn't do it. Yeah. I didn't do it. What did you do when you got out of service? When I got out of the service, um, I had I had saved a lot of money, a lot of mm. 1960, you yes, know, right. seven money, um, and I had it in the bank, and I had no wardrobe, 
so I go buy a new wardrobe. I didn't have a vehicle, so I, I bought a uh, I bought a uh, a car, um, and the rest of course I kept in the bank. And then I wanted to get more education, so uh, we had a, a wonderful tech school in town, Bloomfield, where my uncle was living, and we, and and they had radio and television there. Mm -hmm. You know, to and I was I was really thinking I could start my own radio and television business. And so I went down there, saw those people, and I said, yeah, we, you know, we do adults and everything else, and come on down. And So I did that. And um, it was funny because when I went in, it was all tubes. Oh, yes. There were no transistors yet. Mm. There was none of that. Well, by the time I was finished, almost a year later, guess what? It's all transistors. Yeah. Now, and, and, and half transistors, be half and half, half tubes, mm. half transistors, whatever. The trouble with that is the new television sets, they're throwing them away. They can build them so cheap, mm -hmm. and they have robots building them and everything else. Nobody takes the tubes down anymore. And now, what I'm doing after school, I work for a television um, uh, wholesaler. Mm -hmm. um, not, not the television, pardon me, uh, parts. Mm -hmm. All of the transistors and all the tubes and everything else, and people come in and do this, and we we sell uh, all kinds of big picture tubes, and we sell them, install them, whatever. It was great. It was really great. You really were learning a trade. Well, guess what? The trade just went away. I know. <laughs> so I said to my uncle, I can't take it anymore. I says, you know, I, I want to do something. You know, I want to move ahead, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided to move back home down the shore, down the beach, Asbury Park. And uh, one of my buddies was uh, in the paint business. He says, hey, he says, you know, why don't you come down here and just hang out for a while, you know, and we can hang out and do this and do that. And he says, you know, he says, um, one day he says, you know, he says, you want to make some money? He says, I, I need somebody to run a truck up to here and do this and do that. So I, I can do that. All right, I'll do that. You know, we can hang out, you know. And um, we did that. And within a year, though, I was the manager of the largest Pittsburgh paint store oh, yeah. in the state of New Jersey. Which also had not only was a, a, a paint store, uh, it was this huge wholesale uh, uh, outfit, and then we sold uh, uh, coatings. Uh, that's what the Pittsburgh Paint Company used to call everything uh, to industry. So most of my time, next thing I know, I'm in a suit and I'm going to uh, R.J. Reynolds, and I'm going to uh, Merck Industries, and I'm going to all these huge companies on behalf of PPG Industry Pittsburgh mm. Paint. This goes on for about a year. I'm making very good money and very respected, and everything's. I'm doing a lot with the scientists back and forth because somebody in, in the, you know one of these companies would need something very special, and we'd give them the specs from the company, and then they would the chemist would come up with these wonderful they had paint that you could put on underwater, that you mm -hmm. had to put on with your hands with gloves, on the wharfs down there in New York, so they wouldn't rot out. It would keep all the, the muscles yeah. and everything from eating all the wood. It had a lot of zinc chromate primer in it and stuff, and, and you had to put it on by hand underwater. And uh, just amazing things like that. And uh, it was great. And then they decided to get into the um, wallpaper and paint and decorating. Mm -hmm. So they turned this, this whole store into a decorating center, and it was gorgeous. So we had this beautiful wholesale place in the back and all, and all this commercial sales. In the front, we had this. I get a call. Uh, my wife and I had gone out one night. We come home, and I get a call from my buddy who got me in the company to begin with. Uh, he says, and, and this place is 45 minutes away from where I live. He says, you got to get to your store right now. It's burning. Oh, my. I, so I didn't believe him. This is my best friend, and I think he's teasing me. So I went back to bed. It's ah, right, Danny. Forget it. You old crazy person. I hung up, went back there. No, he calls me back. I'm telling the shopping center's burning. You've got to get there, right? And a second later, the area supervisor he says, Tim, he's not he's not kidding. It's burning. The shopping center's burning. The guy next door had a beauty shop. Now it was just a row of stores, and then some mm -hmm. some of the places had wholesale, you know, stuff and, and commercial mm -hmm. business behind the, the storefronts. Mine covers three stores, including his, but he had moved all of his supplies, this crazy guy, to the front of his store, opened all the boxes, took all the lids off, all this flammable stuff, and at 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, he came by with a firebomb and firebombed right through the front of his store, 
set the whole front of his store on fire, which set that store on fire and our store on fire. And um, the fireman saved the cash register. It's hysterical because there's no money in it. Nobody keeps money in it. It's in a paint can in the back. <laughs> That's how you see that. Do you know, and the reason I'm telling you the story is, we had the most wonderful fire marshal, and he would put up with nothing. That warehouse had to be 1,000% safe. He says, because if this shopping center ever catches fire, I'll never put out all this paint mm. and all this bar soil and all these supplies. I will never put it out. It'll just burn the whole shopping center in the ground. So I couldn't have any any paint stacked any higher than four tiers up. And we had to have, uh, uh, the whole place had to be painted special and fireproof this. All the walls had to be sprayed with fireproof paint. And you know, when the, in spite of the, the uh, all the wallpaper and everything catching fire up front, when the fire got to the warehouse, it came down all but about five or six feet from the ceiling. This is a 20-foot ceiling, and it never burned one can in that mm. warehouse because of him, him and me. Yeah. I mean, but him, because this is the way he wanted mm. it. And, and, of course, our company, Pittsburgh Paint, only wanted it one way, and so mm. it worked out good. So that was it. And, of course, I'd, I also met my wife that way. Reynolds and Reynolds uh, Metal needed special paint. I went and saw them. I got the specs. They told me that where my wife works for the same company. Uh, I said, I know you people have those specs. Can I please have them? I said, I'll take you out to lunch. Didn't even know the gal. I'd seen her, I think, one time, but I didn't know her. And she said, yeah, for lunch. We can go to lunch. No problem. So she calls me back. I can't meet you for lunch. Something came up. I said, i got to have those specs. i got to have them for tomorrow morning. I said, how about supper? And I used to live in Newark, which is next to Corny, New Jersey, and I knew, you know, where her town was and what have you. Took her out for supper, got the specs, had a wonderful time, and didn't talk to her again for about four weeks because it was strictly business with me. I mean, I was a gentleman. We had a wonderful meal, but, you know, I, it was nothing to do with anything else. She called me up. She says, you got some nerve. Who says? <laughs> <laughs> and it's my wife Kathleen and you know, Irish people you see and um, she said you never called me back didn't we have a wonderful time And it, but I've been busy I've been working I don't want to hear it she said you owe me a date and a year and so many months down the road we got married I don't mean to cut this too That's short it. But, but tell me how'd you get to Michigan oh Michigan 9-11 um, Oh, 9-11. Um, we had moved... You, you've only been here since then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, we had uh, um, we had gotten married, and we had children, and we had our first house and uh, in Boundbrook, New Jersey. And I was in the tire business. I wound up in the tire business after the paint business, mm -hmm. because Pittsburgh Paint sold all their stores. Yeah. So uh, I wound up in the tire business, and one of my customers uh, at a tire company, a store, would you come work for me? You took such good care of my wife, and on and on and on. And, yeah, sure. So they sent me to they sent me to school for BF Goodrich Tire Company, and I learned all about tires. And next thing you know, I'm in the tire business, and um, and then I moved out of. I went through like three or four different stores and companies, moving up, moving up. Mm -hmm. Finally, with a very very big company, the, one of the biggest tire companies in New, in New Jersey. And um, um, I bought a house out in the country on the on the um, um, out by the Delaware Water Gap. Yes. And um, oh, yes. Uh, the beautiful Delaware River runs right. A little mm -hmm. town called Belvedere. And um, it was great. And then you know 9/11 happened, and it was hideous. And we're we're all from the New York New Jersey area. And, you know, I get a call from my daughter who has since moved. My oldest daughter had moved to Ohio. And she's calling me and she's crying and screaming because she saw it on TV. A plane is hit. And, you know, I'm from New York. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to explain to her, honey, she thinks it's a military plane. Mm -hmm. I says, honey, it's not. We're not being attacked. I says, but something's really weird because they're not allowed to fly commercial planes yeah. by the Empire State Building. Never mind the Trade Center, just not allowed. And guys would never do that. They're very professional. These are these are wonderful pilots up here. And 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 she's crying, but it's hit, it's hit. And I'm thinking what a horrible accident somebody's did. And all of a sudden, I, 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 I go across the street to tell my buddy who happens to work for 
uh, he's a colorizer for uh, Spider-Man and all the, that comic yeah. uh, that comic group and um, out of New York City and UPS comes every day and he colors everything and he send it back and they put it in the comic books and uh, and I'm saying a plane's hit he says yeah we're up and 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 and, and, and he's getting dressed his wife is in the kitchen and I'm in his living room and I see the other plane. But I don't know it's the other plane. I'm thinking it's they they redid the plane. Yeah. And then they panned over a little bit and you see the burning building. And you see the plane. And this one's already happened. That means this one's on its way. And then they both hit. Oh. And then our whole world changed. I mean yeah. it just it Everybody's just hits you horribly right here yeah. and, and, and you know, it was unbelievable. My wife works in New York City in the Trade Center. Oh, wow. My wife is in building number seven. She's already left for work for the train into New yeah. York every day, which goes underneath yeah. the, tra the Trade yeah. Center, yeah. and she goes over to her building, and she goes up. And... Um, that morning, the first, and I'm at this point, I'm working for a, um, a lab core. I'm working for a laboratory. Then I go around to all these uh, um, uh, hospitals and uh, uh, surgeons and stuff, and I pick up samples and bring them supplies. and And it's a job that is most of the time seven days a week, and I have to, I have to be there. And she has taken my keys by mistake. And while she's waiting for the train to come, she realized she has my keys to open up hospitals and everything else. She's got to go home. She gets off the train uh, area, gets in the car. On the way home, she gets the phone call that the first plane has hit. And she gets home, and she's all in tears and crying and falling apart. During the day, after the planes had hit, when the buildings start to come down, they ruptured um, all the gas lines, electrical lines, to all of those buildings underground. Mm -hmm. Okay? Her building filled with gas and burned to the ground that day. She was never there. The story gets to be more intense. My son has two men in building number two. He's an electrical mechanical contractor. He has two men on the 35th floor of building number two when the plane hit. Except they're in the basement and they're getting supplies. Now we know that the fire was way yeah. above that, but they're in the building when the plane hit it. All the lights went out in the basement. The red lights came on, the emergency lights. And um, they were able to get up because of the red lights and everything and, and get themselves up to the main corridor. And there's all these beautiful, beautiful banks of, um, of, uh, of lifts, you know, that take you up into the building. And um, there's smoke pouring out of those even. At this point, not only has the fire gone up, but now it's coming down through the elevators and coming out the elevator doors. Everything has stopped working. There's no escalators. There's no thing. Mm. And 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 uh, what happened was the two guys got out of the building, and they were safe, mm. and nothing happened to them. And my son wasn't with them. He was back in New Jersey getting more supplies for the two guys. And your wife, luckily, I could have lost kept... my wife. I could have lost my son that day. Yeah. yeah. I didn't lose either one of them. Yeah. With the grace of God, yeah. you know, and faith. This this is going to yep. click off soon, uh, and I don't want to get your wife angry with my, me. My daughter moved out here. It was already out in mm -hmm. Ohio. Kathy and I moved to Connecticut because that's where her other office was. Within two and a half months, I got two part-time jobs real quick, no problem. Everything's fine. We've got a beautiful place. Uh, we turn around and um, uh, she lost her job. Mm -hmm. The company gave her a nice check, love you, letter. Exactly. They didn't know where to put 4,000 people that were in that building. Yeah. I called my daughter in Ohio says I'm coming out. We were there for almost a year. She moved up here. She bought the house next door. This house became vacant. I bought this house. Welcome to Michigan. Right. And then I got involved with all the veterans, and I haven't stopped yet. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's, well, been, that's been years ago. And I love what I do, take care of the vets. I, I, I'm sorry we have to end this. And as I say, 
Kathy's going to be angry at one of us if you don't get going. I got to pick up four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, a pleasure. You know care. that. Okay. God bless.